basic science primer today, guys. A lot of we send a lot of lab tests, a lot of lab tests, like an insane amount of lab tests um, in order to help us make our diagnosis. Um, and inevitably, probably have a lot of scenarios like this. Um, you may get questions from your peers, from your patients, from what have you, um, kind of along the realms of, of these, like what the heck is an indeterminate quant? Can I operate or not? Um, or maybe you've got a Karen saying, why the heck is this test so expensive? Y'all in Big Pharma's pocket or something? Um, you may have your own scumbag Steve patient who uh, is like, how trustworthy is this positive STD test really? Um, and then, of course, there's always the frazzled hospitalist who's saying, if I don't send bed 307, bed one home today, I will kill you. How long? Why is your test taking so long to result? So you'll get a lot of questions dealing with the tests that you're asking for um, and the tests that you've ordered. Um, in order to make your diagnosis and, and put patients on the right form of treatment. And then when you have kind of more sensitive infectious diseases, stuff like STDs, um, HIV, that sort of thing, um, patients are probably going to want to know, you know, how, how, how real is my, is my positive result? And so in that particular sense, it's really important to know your arsenal. Um, it's really important to know what exactly the tests that you're doing do. Um, <laughs> And what exactly, um, and what exactly the pitfalls of a potential test could be, and then it's kind of important to know too, as you become uh, leaders at the hospitals that you're at, you know, you're gonna be probably a point of contact for testing that's coming up in the future. So it's important to understand what the financial limitations of some of these testings might be, um, what the uh, kind of overhead burden um, for getting supplies or machines or something for these tests might be and why we may need to send it out, you know, certain tests out to a lab in Wisconsin, uh, thereby increasing your wait time by quite a bit. Um, why we don't have one of those sitting in the TGH or the VA lab right now. Um, so this is nowhere near a comprehensive, like fully detailed uh, study into every test that's available. Um, I pick some kind of generalized testing based on some of the stuff that we order a lot of or testing that is kind of uh, new or novel um, that we probably are getting the hang of ordering a lot, but maybe don't fully understand why it works the way it works. Um, and important to understand why because of how because of how it works, why they can sometimes be very pricey tests that perhaps the hospitals you might go to in your practice aren't quite ready to adopt them yet. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the immunoassays. A lot, an insane amount of your tests are gonna be done via some form of immunoassay. Probably the most common that you're gonna come up with are EIAs or um, enzyme immuno, uh, immunoassays, um, mostly in the form of ELISAs. And these can come in various different forms. Uh, you're unlikely if you look up LabCorp, if you look up, you know, your, your TGH lab, are they going to tell you the specific ELISA that they're using? But you'll see that they do come in different flavors, um, all with their benefits and drawbacks. Um, the great thing about using an ELISA test is that you can test for the pre presence both of antigen and of antibody. So, for instance, tests that we're te testing for antigen that use ELISA in order to um, to, to detect the antigen of interest. Your histoplasma test, for instance, could be one of them. Your C. diff toxin, A, A, A and B that you see all the time, you'll see, oh, well, what was the EIA? Did you order the EIA? EIA? This is what they're talking about. Um, and then your HIV P24 antigen for your HIV testing. This is the type of assay that they would use. Long story short, what they're looking for is that uh, in, in kind of one of this is an example of a type of ELISA assay that you see here in the for a sample that would be positive you have these wells that are coated with an antibody specific to the antigen that you're looking for so once you apply that to the well of interest and then block off all of the areas in the well that are not coated by antibody to avoid any background signal you're then going to apply your your sample if for instance, let's say we're talking about P24, your P24 antigen, if in the sample, is going to bind to your antibody. If it's not in the sample, you're not going to have any binding at all, or theoretically should have no binding at all. After that, you wash it off, apply a secondary antibody. This is uh, conjugated to an enzyme. 
usually these enzymes produce some sort of color or some sort of heat or sort of something that can be then be mapped and 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 quantified for a positive result. Um, so basically, what you end up with is a process that is fairly specific for a particular particular if you're using if you're using this particular type of, of assay. You can do the opposite as well. You can actually have an antigen that you bind to the well, same general thing, block off all the parts of the well that aren't covered in antigens so that you don't have crosstalk, and then use an antibody and a secondary antibody to then bind and be able to detect using an enzymatic assay. So examples for this would be your HIV-1, HIV-2 antibody testing. Your strongyloides that you, it, that you order is going to be done kind of in this methodology. So to kind of give you an idea of the various types of ELISA that are out there, and again, when you look these up on LabCorp or Quest or whatever you're using, they may not specify, oh, it's a direct ELISA or an indirect ELISA. They're just going to say ELISA. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you, it's good to understand, especially when you're reading papers on tests that are upcoming or you know, studying new interests, studying new antibodies, to really understand the kind of ELISA that they're using. Um, to potentially point out some of the advantages and disadvantages to the testing that they're using. So you can use what is a direct ELISA. And so basically this is, this is an antigen binding test. So you're binding antigens, including the desired target, to the plate itself. So like you get a little like 96 wall plate kind of thing. And you basically have a specific antibody that is conjugated to an epitope in that an antigen. And then that antibody itself has a direct enzyme tethered to it. Then when you introduce substrate, it produces a signal. So the good advantage to a direct ELISA is that you only need one antibody. Um, if you've done an antibody design or you've tried to order antibodies, you can real, you re realize very, very quickly that getting antibodies for some antigens is much, much, much harder than it seems, um, be it a stability reason, be it that there's no market for it, what have you. Um, and if you have an antibody that is rarely used, it can sometimes be very pricey. Um, this can also be very fast. So when you do these steps, you apply your antigen, you wash, you block, you wash, you place your antibody, you wash, you place your substrate, and then you get a signal. So each one of these incubation steps does take a little bit of time. So the fewer incubation steps, the fewer washes you have, the less time your test is going to take to come back. So of all the ELISAs, this is the fastest one. So why not do them all this way? The problem is sensitivity. Um, when you have fewer kind of, think of it kind of like a cheese hole method, that it, it, the more blocks you make to potentially getting a positive signal, the more kind of layers of testing you add, the less likely you are to get a signal that is non-specific and non-sensitive. So this antibody could potentially bind to antigens that are not your target of interest, so you could get a false positive. Um, so can be quick if you need a quick answer, but potentially low specificity, low sensitivity. An indirect allies is similar, only instead of having the enzyme directly conjugated to one antibody, it's conjugated to a secondary antibody. So these are the ones that you may have seen if you did any of these things in kind of a, an undergraduate microbiology lab or a cell biology lab. This is probably close to the allies that you used if you, if you um, if you did this experiment, if you did an experiment that was similar. So same general principle applies. You're binding antigens to the well. So say you're H HIV P24, and then you're actually going to use two antibodies. The first antibody is going to be against the antigen. So it'll be an anti HIV antibody. And then the second one is going to be anti to the first antibody. And the idea here is to try to avoid as much nonspecific binding as possible. So you basically get this little stack of antibodies that secondary antibody has your enzyme attached to it, apply your substrate, you get your signal back. This has much higher sensitivity than using a direct ELISA, which is why it's preferred as far as your antibody non-sandwich uh, ELISAs. The problem again is that you can get cross-reactivity anytime you're using um, antibodies of any sort. You could potentially you introduce the possibility that these antibodies are not just going to bind to the target of interest. So this first primary antibody can bind to something that isn't your antigen target. Your secondary antibody can then bind to something that isn't your antigen target or your primary targets. <laughs> so you could potentially get false signal. Um, 
and again, you may have a lot of background signal as well, which you have to have to account for. But this can be a lot more specific. And again, you run into the problem where you have to have now two stocks of antibody, one to what you're testing and then one to actually have your, your reaction. Probably the most used and probably the best as far as sensitivity and specificity is concerned is the sandwich ELISA. And so the idea here is that you actually have a well plate that's already pre-coded with an with a and with an antibody of choice for the antigen you're looking at. So when you apply your serum, the first thing it's going to do is pull that antigen out. So rather than dumping an antigen in a bi in a binding plate and just letting it wash over and whatever stick sticks. The idea here is that you're trying to pull out your antigen of interest. So when you throw it in that plate, instead of everything just sticking to the plate, what it's going to do is it's going to anything that binds that antibody is going to stick and everything else will wash away when you wash it out. So the idea there is to up the amount of the antigen of interest that you have in your actual plate. So for instance, this would be an anti P24 antibody that then bombs onto your P24 out of your serum. And then you use kind of an indirect ELISA method in order to detect. So again, now you're dealing with three antibodies. So by doing this, you're adding to cost and adding to complexity of your of your um, of your assay. So you can understand where the costs start getting a little bit prohibitive um, after a while, especially if you're if you're if you're dealing with organisms who are a little more uncommon. Nobody is going to, if you live in Florida, stock a whole lot of these sandwich ELISA with these antibodies for, say, paracoxy, um, if they don't have to. And these do have a shelf life because um, antibodies don't exactly, you know, aren't exactly going to be functional for the longest time. The enzymes on the secondary antibodies too can go bad after a while and not be able to produce a signal. So you may have to send them to a specialist lab just because nobody's going to keep them in stock if it's a rare disease. <laughs> um, the last kind of ELISA that you can use and is a little bit more uncommon, but still, but still used is called the competitive ELISA. So the idea here is that you have, again, kind of like the sandwich ELISA, you have an antibody coded, coded well. And what you're looking for is, uh, is basically a signal uh, uh, kind of drowning out um, of a, a versus a competitor. So you have a, uh, a uh, sample antigen that, that is in there um, and a conjugated antigen to a specific amount of antibody. So when you put it, so these basically, whichever you have more of is going to outcompete the other basically. And that's the signal that's gonna kick back. Um, it's useful for small targets that can't easily be bound to antibodies, but has very low specificity. So it's not really used a whole lot. So your most common tests are probably gonna be used sandwich, are gonna be sandwich ELISAs, but not always. Um, so when you're looking in papers, they're talking about kind of developing new testing and, and, and detectability. It's important to know kind of what the researchers and their papers are using for these upcoming tests, because that's what's ultimately going to translate to the to industry and what's ultimately going to be the test that you're going to be using in the clinic. Um, but anytime you see EIA, ELISA, it's one of these four methods that they're using in order to to detect your your pathogen of interest. So kind of along those same lines, let's talk about a very popular test that uses Analyza um, that you guys probably order every day and maybe not realize that that's what you're ordering. Um, Quantifier on gold. So basically all this is, is, a, is it down the line is a fancy Eliza. <laughs> um, so what exactly happens when we order this? Why does it take so long? Um, and why is it that we have a bunch of people who you know, you get your panel back and they're like, what the hell do all these numbers mean? Why is there an indeterminate sometimes? Why is it that, you know, you, you may have a failing in diagnosing a person with either latent or active TB uh, based on the testing results? So best to understand how the whole assay works. So you go in, you draw your blood from your patient, take it to the lab. You're going to incubate that blood against four four things, and I use four very, very loosely. You're going to have one sample where you do nothing. You're going to take the blood, you're going to let it sit. It's going to be exposed to everything, to everything background-wise that the other tests are going to be exposed to. This is a background test. All you're looking for is how much interferon gamma, gamma does your body make at a baseline, and that's going to be what you subtract all your other values from. All right, so that's your nil sample. So whenever you say see TB nil, that's what they're measuring. What is your background interfering gamma? You then have two 
TB1, TB2 testing. And basically what these are doing is that they're adding in peptides from known TB proteins. So you're adding the ESAT6 and CFP10 proteins from TB. And when you do them in TB1 and TB2, basically what they're doing is that they're adding short and long peptides. They found that depending on whether or not you add a short or a long peptide, you get a CD4 or a CD4 CD8 response. So it's basically accounting for all T cell response that could lead to interferon gamma um, um, uh, 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 up, up regulation. And the last one is your positive sample. So that's, mit that's mitogen. So it's going to basically cause an interferon gamma response. The idea of doing this test is to make sure your T cells are good enough, <laughs> that you have enough, that you're able to make interferon gamma at a reasonable level. So when, they, when you tickle them a little bit with these TB proteins, you can even get a response to begin with. So basically, you take those four tests in total, and that's how you make a determination if you have enough of an uptick in your interferon gamma in exposure to your TB proteins to constitute you having a response to it, a measured response to it that uh, implies a prior exposure to TB. So you in intubate these guys together. It's about 16 to 20 to 24 hours that you int intubate this blood with these quote unquote four things. Then you take that plasma and you're going to do an ELISA, basically. Um, the ELISA goes against interferon gamma, and this is what it spits out. So you're going to see your NIL test, TB1, TB2, and your uh, TB nitrogen. <laughs> so basically, a positive test is you're taking your TB1 or your TB2, subtracting out your NIL, which is your, your baseline. And if you have a difference that is greater than 0.35 or greater, uh, or and greater than 25% of the NIL, you're a positive test. So basically you're producing way more interferon gamma in the presence of TB protein than you would just at baseline. A negative result is the mitogen minus the nil uh, and a, a, that's greater than 0.5. And so you have a response to even measure against. Um, if this is less than that, it kind of implies that maybe your T cells don't work as well as they should. So you can't really trust the test. Um, to make a robust enough res response to make a diagnosis. Um, but you also have to have a TB1 and TB2 minus the nil that is less than 0.35 or greater than 0.35, but less than 25% of the nil. That's what's considered a negative test. Indeterminants get a little sticky. Um, basically, if you end up with uh, a TB test or mitogen minus the nil that is less than 0.5, you can end up with an indeterminate test. So it's hard to say, you know, did you have a reaction? Is it that your nil is too high? Is it that your mitogen interaction is too low? Or did something else go wrong with the test? So it's really you got to either do repeat testing or further testing to figure out where exactly the issue is. So great tests, actually, for the most part. Sensitivity is 94%, specificity is 97%, way better than the TST test. And unlike the TST test, it's a one and done thing. You take your blood, you get your result, boom, you're done. You don't have to go back. There's no, you know, first day reading these things. People look at it and go, oh, it's red. You've got TB. They send you in. You don't actually have TB because it's not in duration. It's redness. Um, cons to the test. Really hard to interpret if, you're, if your immune system doesn't work right. So if you have immunosuppression, you're on drugs that suppress your interferon gamma response anywhere in that cell line response. You're going to have a damn hard time interpreting this test, so it's probably not the best test for those people. It is not useful for detecting active versus latent TB. All you know is that somewhere in your journeys in life that you've been exposed to the antigen. That's all you can tell. Um, the sample needs to be in the lab in 12 hours. So you're starting out in the beginning. You're taking something that is live and biological, and then you're exposing it to peptides in order to get a biological response. So taking your sample, leaving it at that for your ADM patient, leaving it in the office for 12 hours and then shipping it out on a warm truck all the way over, you know, to the lab down the street that's, tw you know, maybe 24, 36 hours till they log that sucker in, it's not going to work. Mm. <laughs> so you have to, you have to make sure that you process your samples quickly, which means that you need to have access to an area where you can get that sample 
to a lab quickly, which is why a lot of places do have quantifiron in-house. Um, could be a problem if you're backwoods and you don't have access, you know, in, in, in a cabin in bear country. But for the most part, most places can do it. Um, there are a couple studies out there had, that have suggested that the false negative rate might be um, a little bit unnecessarily high for extra pulmonary TB. Um, there was a Japanese study that was done for people that have uh, known TB in other areas of the body um, and actually ended up having a negative test. They really weren't quite sure why that's the case. Um, but just as an FYI, because we are seeing people, um, especially that come in TGH, that have had uh, extra pulmonary TB in the genitalia, for instance, or chest, or like the chest cavity as opposed to the lungs themselves. Um, so just as an FYI to, to the potential fallbacks of quantum gold. Of course, that's a, those people would have active TB, right? Right. And the, yeah. not really. It's, and that's the thing. It's not a particularly great test for that anyhow, but it's just kind of interesting that they they, they had the exposure and who knows how long they've been sitting on that, um, that they may or may not produce a response, even though they perhaps should if they've kind of had this like smoldering TB in their testicles, for instance, for several months. Does it, um, if somebody has active TB, does it change the sensitivity and specificity of the quantum parent gold at all? Like, does it, re do they somehow end up with a reduced I mean, I, I would imagine that it might affect your background, but I don't think it would affect the actual testing itself because... So you would expect it to be positive if somebody had it. That would be more innate to the test, right? So what if you're, let's say, prevalence, or what if, so if, uh, the other aspect of the test that would depend on that, let's say, you know, would, would be like if you have a higher prevalence of the disease, that will affect your positive predictive value or negative predictive value, but not so much the sensitivity and specificity itself. But many infections like TB can be suppressed. So the question is, does it reduce your monitoring response? So could it affect the test in that way? And I think that's what you're asking. Because of the, yeah. Because, because of the, the infection itself. Back. Right. And, and so that may, in fact, affect the test. Right. So it, it's kind of one of the, it's, I think it affects less the response to exposure to, when you test it against exposure to peptides and more to what your background response are. What is your background interferon gamma level because you've got active infection? versus do you have a bit of a, a, a you know, T cell response that do secondary to infection? And so it's probably gonna affect the controls more than it's gonna affect the actual testing. Um, so again, makes it very hard to interpret if you've got, you know, raging infection. And it kind of goes back to that whole, if you have an unusual uh, immune system or a compromised immune system at that time, is it the best test? And that's why we're just like, why are you getting quantifier on golds on septic patients in the ICU? Probably not the best test for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you might as well go for the kill. Um, some mycobacterium cross react with. This. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and that's another thing that you need to take into consideration is it's not, it doesn't have perfect, because you can see it doesn't have perfect specificity. High specificity, but not perfect. Right. So. Dr. you recently that back to TV I don't know if it's pulmonary or others, but it's this is only positive for at least sixty percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I. That's kind of what I remember. That maybe it, it kind of changes some of the. Right, and it's probably it's probably because you're you have to compare it against backgrounds. It's probably the background that's messed up, and that's why you won't get a good response out of it because mm -hmm. you're already firing a lot of these responses. The idea there is that you have a low level of disease, like if you're doing a latent TB, you probably have a low enough level of disease where you have circulating antibodies that could, and, and circulating uh, immune system uh, components that will activate quickly because you already have exposure to TB. So the idea there is that when they incubate it, all of a sudden, boom, your immune system turns on because like, oh my God, there's more TB, yum, 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 and makes this interfere on gamma. Now, if you're already making crap loads of it because you're actively infected, <laughs> in order to see the nuance between, oh, I gave you a little sprinkle of TB antigen, I mean, you need to give a pretty large sprinkle of TB antigen to further upregulate your, your interferon gamma. Your so, nil would be very high. So your nil is probably going to be high. And because you're, you're actively sick, your mitogen might be low. <laughs> so it becomes a little, a little bit hard to interpret with an active infection for that reason. Um, so he is so I mean it's it's unsurprising then that you probably only have positivity 60% of the time because your body's not not acting the way it should. It's probably it's got more interferon gamma going than it normally would, and T cells that probably aren't working as hot as they would when they normally would. So it seems like it would be the same for if you had any other kind of illness. 
<laughs> it could. Well, and it could potentially be, and that's why, like, if you have somebody who has AIDS, this is not a great test. <laughs> So, because you're you're you already know that your mitogen your mitogen background is gonna suck. <laughs> so, it's, so it's one of those things again that you're not gonna see too many ID people that are gonna be like, "Yay, I'm so excited! You got the quantifieron on the septic patient on three pressers! Yay, great idea!" Especially considering that there are other things that are non-infectious that could flare your immune response as well. They could regulate the upregulation of interferon gamma as well. So, do you get uh, if even if you do have a perfectly good robust response? You're already upregulating all the, uh, you know, these pathways to try to, you know, SOS. But so again, one of those tests that's very, very helpful, especially in the outpatient setting, maybe not so much in the acute setting when somebody is sick and that, this is why it's not helpful. Um, so interpret with caution. <laughs> Dr. Canella has an ad raised. Canella, I knew, I yeah. knew you'd pop in eventually. Jessica, this is, this is awesome. So Tony Catanzaro actually, when he designed his test back in the early 2000s, and in, in its cousin test, the T-spot, these are both L-spot tests. So when you, when you describe ELISA, we're talking about um, you know, using a, a, a cell to actually make it, make the antibody, right, to make the, the, the substrate that you're actually looking for with the antibody. And the T-spot is, is a better version of the quantiferon goal. The, the interesting thing about it is, is that in patients who do not have, who do not make interferon gamma whatsoever, like patients who have an autoantibody to it, uh, this test is garbage. And so again, this is, this is one of the lovely things about what the good doctor, Dr. Kennedy is showing in her presentation today, is, is that your test is only as good as number one, your patient, two, the tech, and three, the substrate that you're looking for. So even though people put a lot of weight before, you know, in back of the quantiferon gold, you know, plus, it's not ideal. It only tests for four of the, you know, 3,500 different peptides that T cells recognize for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. And so, you know, for, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's okay. But there, you know, if you are, if you're really concerned about this, a T spot might help you out, um, you know, a little bit better in terms of pouring you in that direction. Regardless, you still need tissue and you need culture in the at the end of the day. But this is this is an excellent, excellent explanation of how quantiferon gold works. Thank you. <laughs> so kind of along those same lines, chemiluminescent assays. Your hepatitis antibody tests oftentimes work using this methodology. Um, this can be a little bit more expensive. Basically, you're using kind of similar um, to what you use well testing. You're using magnetic beads that you incubate with your particular sample. Those are going to bind antigen. You then have antibodies that are labeled to your antigen of uh, question. You then use secondary antibody with a particular tracer on it. They can produce a signal that you read. Um, this is also how you get your COVID IgG, or, um, interestingly enough. High specificity, stable reagents, so, and for it are used oftentimes for stuff that we test a lot of. I mean, who do you know who doesn't have a COVID IgG or a hepatitis somewhere in their chart? Um, limited test panel. Um, again, design, design, design. You have to have the antibodies and the conjugated an uh, antibodies in order to, to do this. I'm like, magnetic beads, if you've ever purchased any in a lab, are not cheap little tiny vial of little magnetic beads is like 200 freaking dollars. So you can imagine how expensive this test can get. Um, so money, 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 money. Um, so if a hospital has a choice between using something like this <laughs> um, versus a much cheaper, say multi-well ELISA, you're gonna cheap out on you. Um, but this is this is good, especially for the, maybe not so much for the COVID IG, because I, I question the question the utility of it but as far as your hepatitis very important if you're getting if you're if you need to be sure about about the diagnosis so just another potential way that you can use these immunoassays in order to get yourself a potential result lateral flow assays also seen and in, in rapid testing so you guys have maybe seen these your little strippy poos so your strep pneumo rapid testing rsv rapid testing if flu rapid testing rotavirus, your HIV rapid test to send everybody to the Department of Health, um, some of your uh, GI pathogens, 
we don't have them, but in places where it's more endemic, your malaria rapid testing. And then for those gentlemen with 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 children, you may have seen these in your in your recent um, uh, journeys. This is how a pregnancy test works. <laughs> So basically what you're doing is they are taking your analyte and basically you're relying on capillary fl flow to pull your analyte through a line of antibodies. And that's where you get your various lines for. So you apply your, an your an analyte to this absorbent sample pad. And basically what you're going to have is that you're going to have antibodies that are conjugated to a poten potential tag. You're then going to have those bind your antigen and they're going to continue to flow using kind of a, a capillary type action to these potential antibodies. So you have a test line, which is what you're, buying, you're testing your antigen for, and a control line, which is just will unspecifically bind the first antibody, just to make sure that the, the analyte made it all the way over through the test strip, and that that antibody that's in that original pad up here actually works. And so basically, that's why you get your two lines on your pregnancy test or your two lines on your COVID test. Basically, what it's what it's doing when you, you it get the test line is basically saying that, hey, you have binding of the antigen of interest into the specific antibodies for that antigen of interest. So these are awesome tests if you're living out in Burr country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need many resources, small amount of sample. If you got little kids and you're just like, oh, you'd be lucky to get, you know, drop a blood out of them as they're screaming and trying to box you, trying to, <laughs> you know, for a blood sample. These are awesome because very little amount gets the job done um, and they're fast. So anybody who's taken a pregnancy <laughs> test, a COVID test knows, yeah, do your little thing, put your little analyst, shake it up. And three minutes later, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You got an answer. Um, so awesome for that sense. Cons, potential false negatives. We've all seen, oh, I don't know, this is the COVID test. Or if you've left a pregnancy test out for 12 hours, you're like, oh, well, that changed. So you have to be cognizant of reading it at the right time, making sure that you're reading it uh, critically. Um, and of course, you can't have quantitative testing. So nobody really cares so much in you know, pregnancy, it is, it is or isn't. But <laughs> um, in, in, your, in the sense of your, say, COVID, can't be like, wow, I've got a lot of COVID. <laughs> you either have COVID or you don't have COVID. So really kind of hard to tell, especially when we when we talk about how long have they had this COVID? What is their quote unquote cycle threshold of this COVID? Is it more of an acute or subacute presentation of COVID? Or are they just viral shutters, that sort of thing? Um, so good for a quick answer to lead you down to further testing. Um, or if you've got something like, hey, kiddo just comes in with strep throat, you just need to know if they have strep, give them their little antibiotics, send them on their way. Five days later, they're terrorizing their elementary school. Um, so great, great. This is going to be important for gentlemen here. Maybe not so much for the, for the rest of us. But anybody who travels overseas, especially to resource limited areas, may see a lot more of these kind of uh, lateral flow assays and rapid tests. Immunodiffusion. Um, an interesting test um, with kind of limits. So this is one of those tests that are used for some of the more rare um, uh, organisms that we test for. So histoplasma, paracoxy are using immunodeficiency assays. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're taking your patient's antiserum, so basically your serum antibodies, and you're testing them against known antigens. So if you look here, this is roughly what a what an immunodeficient uh, immunodiffusion assay looks like against histoplasmin, which is one of your antigens from histoplasma. So you would place your sample of your serum into your central well, and basically what it's going to do is it's just going through an agar plate. Basically, there's just agar plates with little chunks in them. So you place your your antigens of interest. So, for instance, in this particular example, they have histoplasmin H. Ooh, sorry. Have histoplasmin H in this well, this well, and this well. You can't see oh, oh, you can't. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so the histoplasmin H is bump, 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 and then your histoplasmin plasmin M, which is another potential uh, antigen from uh, from histoplasmin, is in this well, this well, this well. And so basically, what's happening is you apply your liquid, your serum, and what it's going to do is it's going to diffuse through the agar. The same thing is happening with your antigens. You apply them in here, boom, they diffuse through the agar. So basically, you're going to start eventually getting these overlapping circles 
where the two meet. And if they bind, what you get is a precipitation as the antibody and the antigen come together. And so that's where your positive line comes in. And so basically, you can test. So in this particular sample, what they put here, if, they, if you had your patient serum and you put them in here, this particular serum is interacting with both histoplasmin M and histoplasmin H, which implies that they have antibodies against histo. Okay, so that's basically what they're looking, they're looking for in some of these tests. You run into a couple of issues, um, one of which may have to do with if your patient has a lot of antibody or you put way too much antigen in those wells, um, you kind of get your prozone and postzone effects where you might not get this precipitation line because you've got too much excess of one of those and they can't form no noticeable precipitable um, lines. So you have to be very careful and you may have to dilute this sample if you have somebody who has a very robust antibody response. So what the pros of this, pretty simple, all things considered, inexpec inexpensive. Anybody who's ever made or bought an agar plate, cheap as hell. And all you really do is you just go chunk, 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 little, little, little paper hole, and you can do as many of those tests as you want. You could swap out your antibodies, swap out your antigens, put antibodies in the center against antibodies, put antibodies versus antigens, vice versa. So very, very versatile as long as you have the antibody components. What are the cons? Cons is that it may be nonspecific. Now, histoplasmin is a good example of this. It has been studied that histoplasmin C has a lot of nonspecific binding. So if you test histoplasmin C against your antibody serum, you're going to get a response. But if you have antibodies against paracoxy, you're also going to get a response. So do they have histoplasma? Yes or no. And that's why over studies that they've actually found that in order to have a positive histoplasma test, you have to have positivity against M and H in order to kind of eliminate the kind of potentiality for nonspecific binding from antibodies to other fungi that may have similar or, or, or same epitopes. So that's why they don't use histoplasmin C to determine if you have histo. Um, so depending on which combination of antigen and antibody that you pick to do your diffusion, you may not get the answer that you're looking for. You may get a positive line, say, uh, you know, if you were to test, say, put your serum in there, test against histoplasmin C, you might go, oh, they have histoplasma, it's interacting, there you go. When in fact, those antibodies are against paracoxy. <laughs> Um, and there just happens to be non-specific <clears throat> binding. So that presents a potential problem, um, especially for lesser studied things. So if you have epitopes that are close enough to other antibodies you got floating around, you're not selecting out antibodies or antigen like you might do with an ELISA. Um, you're, it's all comers. You're dumping all antibodies that are in your serum into that central well. So anything that will bind to that antigen can produce a result. So it may or may not be positive. So the more kind of samples that you give it, against a known antigen, and the more of those that come up positive, the more certain you can be of your result. Um, and it does take a little while. Um, so it's fast as laboratory tests go. It's simple as laboratory tests go, but still does take about a day or two because you are allowing natural capillary action to make this all happen. And then when they finally do meet, you got to take let it let it have time to precipitate out. So it takes about 48 to 72 hours to get a result from this. Um, so you'll find a lot for histoplasma, paracoxy. Some of your astrolytes antibodies, even though depending on which lab you get, you may also see ELISA testing for that. Um, so a lot of good uh, good papers showing you know various different different testing of this, but um, the most common and probably obvious result here is the is the histoplasma. Real time PCR. Everybody loves this test, and you use it way more than you think you do. Um, so everybody knows what PCR is, but for those maybe half of people in the room who don't, basically polymerase, uh, you're, you're, you're using a polymerase chain reaction in order to amplify a particular DNA se se sequence. The power of real-time PCR is that you can measure how much product that you're making over your general cycle time. So how do you do that? You have your primers that are targeted toward highly conserved unique sequences to your target of interest. So let's pick everybody's favorite COVID. All right. So we've designed a set of primers. We throw it in with our with our sample. And if they exist with all of our little PCR uh, 
um, components. Eventually what we'll do is we'll take that small sample of DNA that we have from the patient and turn it and multiply, multiply, multiply out the COVID gene of, of interest from those primers. So how does real-time PCR actually work and why is it actually helpful versus your traditional, oh, you go through your 30 cycles of PCR, you run it through a gel, you get a band, boom. Real-time PCR is awesome because it uses fluorescent dyes and those fluorescent dyes can allow you to quantify in real time and watch the reaction as the product forms as, as rather than wait to the end of all the cycles and see if there's a positive result. So what happens the two most popular ways of incorporating in a fluorescence component is either to use cyber green or to use a TACMAN probe. Um, they both produce a fluorescence just in different ways. So cyber green is a molecule that is going to bind unspecifically to any sort of double-stranded DNA. So you dump a whole bunch of DNA in there. There's always going to be a little bit of a background because it's just bloop, 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 gonna going to attach to everything. You start your polymerase chain reaction. Boom, 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 boom. You're making more and more and more of the DNA product that you're targeting. And the cyber green is going to incorporate into that new product as you make it. So as you make more and more and more copies of that small amount of COVID DNA, cyber green is going to be incorporated and it's going to start glowing. And so as you make more of it, the glowing can be detected. And once it reaches above a certain point, that's when they can call it a positive result. That is your cycle threshold. So whenever you hear that term, it, it basically is asking you how many cycles of PCR does it have to get to before it reaches that minimum threshold where we can consider it a positive result. And so basically, if you're starting with a lot of DNA, as you, if you it's gonna take you a lot fewer cycles to detect that particular amplicon than it is if you have a small amount of DNA. So when we say, well, what was the cycle threshold for this patient? A low cycle threshold means of say 10, 11, means it only took 10 cycles of PCR to go above that baseline threshold to call it a positive test, which means they got a boatload of COVID DNA that they took from that nostril sample. So opposite's true. If you had to go through 30 cycles of PCR before that came above threshold, you got a very small amount of small starting product. It's questionable as to how that translates clinically. However, it has been implied that if you have a very large DNA burden to start with, you're probably more likely to have active disease. And that's how we've been using it in the COVID type setting. You can also use, other than the CyberGreen, a more specific um, TACMAN probe. And basically the TACMAN probe binds to single-stranded DNA. So not only do you have a specified mm -hmm. primer to your target of interest, say COVID, you also have a specified probe to your area of interest. Um, so you can see why, where this might get expensive. So the TACMAN probe basically, once, every, once the, the double-stranded DNA comes apart in order to be amplified again, what it's going to do is it's, when it's incubated with this probe, it's, it's gonna stick to the corresponding single-stranded DNA once it's open. And the TACMAN has a fluorophore and a quencher molecule on it. So while it is bound to the single-stranded DNA and those are in close proximity, that is not going to produce a fluorescent signal. It's only when the TAC polymerase then comes through, turns your open single-stranded DNA into double-stranded DNA while it amplifies, does it knock that probe off, separate out the quencher from the fluorophore, and you get a signal. And so basically it's two ways of potentially getting the same result. Tackman introduces that very like low background noise, which is one of the powerful things about it. But as you can see, it's going to be very expensive to not only design a primer set, but a probe set as well. So RVPs work this way. SARS-CoV-2 works this way. You see it all the time. Um, high sensitivity, high specificity, and you can quantify roughly how much viral load for instance, in, in these that you have, um, which is a highly powerful tool um, compared to, say, something, uh, say, a regular immunoassay, which might not have that power. What are the cons? Pricey, 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 because you need the materials you need to run the actual reaction, and you need the machines to run the actual reaction. 
So the upstart cost for a lot of this can be whoo, 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 quite pricey. So if you're in a small community hospital out in the sticks, it's going to be a little bit harder to get that done than say a big, a big, you know, chungus like, like TGH. Um, you also need a good quality sample. Anybody who's ever, oh, Lord, help me. Anybody who's ever tried to do a PCR <laughs> with a crappy DNA sample knows the pain of this. Um, you're trying to process your student sample and, you know, Dingbat McGee left it out for 48 hours or God forbid every, every scientist's worst nightmare, you walk in and your deep freeze has decided to die overnight. <laughs> Um, and the battery has lived its life out and you walk in and there's a puddle on the floor and everything's thawed to death. Guess what? Your DNA samples are done, Lubo. So same general idea. You go, you swab, you know, Mr. McGee and all of Mr. McGee's, uh, you know, fellow fellow uh, patients on, you know, the fifth floor and you just leave those tests setting out. Over time, that DNA is going to degrade. A crap in product equals a crap out product if you get a reaction at all. So the potentiality, if you don't have a good sample, is that you're not going to get a result at all or an incorrect cycle threshold if you have a very, very low um, amount of actual usable DNA. But awesome, awesome tool if you can get it. Everybody orders this test. I didn't know how it worked when I first ordered it. It's actually pretty freaking rad. Um, so fun to tell. You're sending this out at Moffitt like it's your job. <laughs> and you're just like, I'm looking for beta D glue kit. And that's great. That's fantastic. But do you know how this whole test is working? Well, do gosh darn it. You got you have this little critter to thank for this absolutely wonderful test. Yeah. So did you know that you're actually using a coagulation cascade from a horseshoe crab in order to diagnose fungal infections? Well, now you know. So basically... Some lovely ecologist somewhere studied this ages ago to figure out how do horseshoe crabs clot? That's how they do it. Well, who the heck cares, ecologists? Well, now we've made it clinically, clinically relevant, and that's why science matters, kids. So <clears throat> what it's using is it's using a modified sequence of this coagulation pathway. So if you look at this, uh, this uh, amoebocyte lysate pathway, there are two pathways that the horseshoe crab, I, I say uses as if it knows what it's doing, but uses in order to eventually plot. So basically the, 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 the Fungitel, uh, the company that makes Fungitel has done an amazing thing in that they've shut off half of that cascade to only allow one way for you to get activated factor G, which eventually will make a clotting enzyme that will lead to clotting. Um, and basically that one way is to, to activate factor G is through exposure to BADG glucan. So basically what you're doing is you're taking your sample from your patient, exposing it to this factor G. If beta D glucan is present, it will activate that factor G. And then in the presence of proclotting enzyme from that same from that same uh patient, for lack of a better term, from that same horseshoe crab, you get a clotting enzyme. And then basically what you're looking to do in the horseshoe crab, that's going to lead to clotting. But we are using an artificial substrate in order to get that clotting enzyme to cleave this particular substrate. So this is where your signal is coming from. This clotting enzyme will also act on this short sequence plus a fluorescent marker. And so basically what happens is when you cut that PNA, that PNA, that fluorescent marker off of that artificial substrate, in, in, when it's exposed to that clotting enzyme, you're going to get fluorescence. And when that happens, that's how you can measure for a positive test. So awesome test, really innovative test, really expensive. Um, there have been some papers that have said the sensitivity is really, really good for, especially for invasive asper aspergillosis, about 80 to 90%. So way better even than just doing a, a beta D glucan assay or a galactomanin right off the bat. Um, what are the cons? Um, specificity can be, um, can range quite dramatically between about 36 and 92% for invasive aspergillosis, because as you can imagine, aspergillosis does not have a, uh, is not the only one that can produce beta D-glucan. Um, so while I can tell you, hey, there's something fungal and terrible going on here, I might not be able to tell you specifically which terrible fungal thing it is. Um, so that would require further testing. 
Um, it's expensive. Money, 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 money. Um, and again, probably a send out test for a lot of labs. So it's going to take a little while for this to come back. Anybody who's ordered one <laughs> knows that this is the case. Um, so if you've got a patient who is circling the drain or you have a patient who finally wants to go home after, you know, day 257 on the bone marrow unit, um, this could hold them up quite a bit. Again, leading to cost, 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 cost and unhappy hospitalists. Um, so just be aware that this is a test that takes a while and this is a test that's very expensive. So maybe hard to find South, uh, South Dakota in your, you know, really your, your most backwoods of backwoods hospitals. <laughs> Should you need it? We still, it's still America. Okay. Got, we got the Mayo it? Clinic up there. Is okay. it? <laughs> we have reference tests. And we do have to send a lot of stuff out. Yeah. In our local VA, this gets canceled if you don't get a, you know, if you don't talk to somebody and yeah, no. justify, you know what I mean? When I was in residency, I mean, beg for to tell, you'd have to send uh, it to the Mayo Clinic. Well, and you see uh, why you have to beg for it at the at the VA, because it ain't cheap. <laughs> it ain't cheap. You got it. You have to beg for um, I mean, the VA is a different thing. thing. You got to beg for cheap testing. <laughs> you can literally be like, the guy told me he went swimming in syphilis. Can I please have the treponemal test? <laughs> uh, it depends on, it depends on, on who, <laughs> who's managing the ship. You, you hope there's some vacations going on <laughs> when you were there. So, um, horseshoe crabs, um, do you guys study them at all in like biology? Lab? A little they're, bit. They're, they're, they're like, they're studied a lot because they haven't evolved at all. They predate dinosaurs, but they haven't evolved at all. Like there's no evolutionary, like they still have a third eye. Um, their blood is actually blue. Blue, yeah, yeah right? it's harvested apparently. Like. They, there's another thing about their coagulation pathway that is actually used to test medical equipment. Cause, right. Uh, something to do with endotoxins that I'm not gonna eloquently be able to explain. But, um, <laughs> But they actually use their blood for those purposes as well to, to test the safety, sort of cleanliness of, uh, make sure they're not contaminated by bacterial and mm -hmm. And for a lot of other things, I mean, they, they're used for, it's incredible. It's a million dollar things. industry. And they're not actually crabs, right? They're not crabs. Uh, and that's why you should never shit on basic science. Zebrafish is the reason. Uh, yeah. Zebrafish are the reason you have a lot of your genetic testing. Yeast is the reason you have a lot of your genetic testing in humans. And horseshoe crabs is the reason we have fun to tell. So whenever you're like, what? Not, not to mention birds, right? Yeah. The primary uh, birds feed off of they're like their primary source of food, especially beach birds. So stop shitting on PhD. <laughs> We're important, damn it. Um, <laughs> lastly, we'll talk about um, another one, uh, another test that you may send out a lot, especially in Moffitt. Um, everybody's favorite, the Boricon is all level. How exactly are they getting this level? What they're using is LCMSMS or liquid chromatography uh, tandem mass spectrometry. Um, basically, the great thing about this is, is you can identify and, quant and quantify target from any body fluid. You take your CSF, you take your serum, you take your ejaculate, whatever. You can take it and eventually find a product that you're looking for. So I'm going to use boriconazole as a particular example here. Um, basically, what you're doing is a way to filter out of your whole serum down, 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 down to the product of, of uh, interest. So basically you start with liquid chromatography. You're going to dump your serum. You take your blood from your patient. You're like, how much more is in this sucker? Boom, you're gonna stick it in to your liquid chromatography. You can put any column under the bloody sun in there. Columns that separate based out on size. Columns that separate based out on charge. So that do it based on particular groups. Do hydrophobicity, name it. You can pick a column based on the kind of molecule you're trying to eliminate. So basically, when you put it through this column, boom, 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 what it's going to do is it's going to start separating components out based on the factors that you've selected for. So let's say that you've selected for, oh, I want to separate my, high, my highly uh, hydrophilic from my very hydrophobic molecules. So you use an appropriate column. You're going to have, say, the hydrophobic stuff really stick to that column and you're going to have your hydrophilic stuff just rip on through. 
So you run it through your hydrophobic stuff, stick, 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 stick. Your hydrophobic stuff just <laughs> bleeds on through. And then eventually you introduce a hydrophobic flow through that's going to slowly pull off based on how hydrophobic your molecule is. And you can do this for size, you can do this for charge, you can do this for a lot of things. So what you pick here depends. And if you go into any lab, they probably have like 15 columns sitting there and you just swap them out for the experiment that you're using. So basically what you're going to end up with is a kind of separated out, purified, purified sample based on a chemical property of your choosing. Now I say purified in the sense that there are going to be a lot of molecules that share that same general kind of chemistry, but it's going to separate out a lot of the other background noise. So let's say you've chosen based on hydrophobicity, you found a particular peak, you know, where you expect your boriconazole to elude out. You then take that and you ionize it. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn it into a very fine spray, and this very fine spray is then going to have an electric, it's going to have an electric charge uh, applied to it. How many ions get stuck on it depends on what it looks like chemically. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to stick it through the mass analyzer, your mass spec, which is this chungo over here. OK, so what you're going to do is you're going to take this very fine spray with all of your potential samples that you cleaned out of your of your liquid chromatography. You've now applied a charge to them so you can stick them through a trip, uh, uh, through a uh, quadrupole. What that's going to do is it's going to separate out all of the stuff that came off of your drain in a mass to charge ratio. <clears throat> so it's going to separate stuff out based on its size and based on how many things, how many charges got sent to it during the ionization process. So by using purified products, we already know what the general mass to charge ratio of the thing we're testing is. So it's already been studied with pure boriconazole. When you put it through this first, Trip quadruple, which of those peaks, which mass to charge ratio corresponds to boriconazole? So we can select for that particular mass to charge peak. So what it does is it goes through this quadrupole. It's, it's going to basically spit things out on the other end, depending on the mass to charge ratio. And we are going to tell the machine, I only want things in the mass to charge ratio that measure at 380.1. I don't care about any other peak throw it away. So everything that's not our peak of interest goes bye bye. And then our 380.1 that we do care about that we have proven is is the mass to charge ratio in the first quadrupole for boriconazole goes into collision cell, which is basically another quadrupole. But instead of using it to pull things out, we're using it to fragment up that boriconazole further. Now, there are plenty of different other things that could have the same mass to charge ratio as boriconazole. So basically, you're filtering out all 380.1s, not necessarily just boriconazole. So that's why you send it through a second quadrupole. Basically, we've studied by using pure sample that when we take that particular mass to charge, we pound it and break the molecule up, that we get a certain fingerprint when we stick it through a second quadrupole. Mm -hmm the second mass charge that we're looking for. And that is the peak that we look for on this on the other end. So basically what we're doing is putting whole blood, separating it out to get the general kind of class that we would expect boriconazole to come off of using the column that we've selected, then ionizing it, putting it through a quadrupole to separate out based on the mass charge we expect from boriconazole, then putting it through collision to further kind of clean up the sample of things that have similar mass to charge ratios and then putting it through a second quadrupole in order to pull out the mass to charge ratio we expect after it's gone through the collision cell for boriconazole. So what you get on the end is boriconazole. Now, if you have a lot of this molecule, you're going to get a very high peak, a little bit of this molecule, small peak. And that's how they're able to quantify how much you have. So basically, this is a really, really, really good way if you have a standard tested against of getting a particular molecule and a quantity. So it can be very, very, very highly specific, more specific than immunoassays, because you don't have to worry about binding. But as this, as said, you can only compare it if you have something to compare it against. So they talk about all the time, well, why can't you put XYZ in the Molly TOF for the same reason you can't put it in the, in the MSMS? 
because you don't have something verified against it. You don't have it validated for that machine. And the idea is that people have taken known organism and haven't been able to establish a mass spectrometry pattern yet. And that's why it's not usable. So basically after testing over and over again, they're like, every time we test it, Vori comes out at this peak, this peak, this peak, this is what you're looking for. Then you can use it as, as an actual viable testing method. Cons, this is expensive as hell. Okay, so when I was in, when I was in grad school, the liquid chromatography machine alone, we had one in our lab, it cost us a million dollars. It's expensive, okay? And that's if you have a couple of columns and a couple of things that it can do. So you can imagine if you're testing multiple things, multiple different, different uh, pro let's say protein peptides that you're looking for, for a particular disease or multiple different molecules that you're looking for for certain drug levels, the number of columns you have to stock and maintain is insane. <laughs> the buffers you're gonna have to use, I mean, those are liter bottles, okay? So you're using liters and liters and liters of buffer every time you run one of these experiments. So after a while, the cost adds up. Then the actual MSMS machine, forget about it. That sucker's real expensive. So you're not going to, and you have to have all of the necessaries in order to run this thing. You have to have necessary plumbing. You have to have the necessary space for it. You have to have skilled personnel who knows how to maintain it and knows how to clean it and knows how to do all of this stuff. So you can imagine that this would be very prohibitive to a lot of places. So when places are, you know, get excited about their Molly Toff, be excited for them <laughs> because mass spec ain't cheap. And that's one of the cheapest potential mass specs. So Molly Toff is one of the least specific and the and most and, and cheapest ones. So you get something like this, which is highly specific and, and quantifiable. And my God, you're talking the cost is insane. And then you have to have somebody on the other end who knows what the heck they're doing, who knows how to interpret your results from your peaks and knows how to troubleshoot if your peaks don't look right. So you're going to have to pay a lot of people in order to do the super powerful tool if you can get it. And that's why you're shipping out your Voriconazole level. And that's why it takes seven damn days to come back. <laughs> because EA ain't going to buy one of these. <laughs> TGH ain't going to buy one of these. <laughs> Moffitt's not going to buy one of these. So some rich lab somewhere is making bank because they own one of these machines. So unfortunately for those tests, the, the vast majority of places you're going to be working, it's going to be shipped out. And this is why. Awesome test. Very, very, very expensive. Besides like boriconazole, is there any other like other lab thing that this thing can be used for? I mean, what else? Can Other drug levels? So you, so drug drug levels of, of any kind as long as they have as long as they have a standardized a standardized uh like ms ms profile that you can measure against so if they have tested uh for you know if they have and that's when they're talking about the um i'm trying to think of the term that they use um when they say oh it's been like verified or something like that or our particular machine's been verified for that particular organism or been verified for the particular molecule so as long as you know what your master charges are going to be when they come out of these triple quadrupoles then you could use it so if you have a new molecule for instance a new drug you're going to have to go through prerequisite testing to be like when you take this out of serum and you know when you are rather when you use this pure molecule what is your profile before you ever apply it to serum so new drugs you're unlikely to be able to use this for levels until that's all been verified just using standard controls but once you have that standardization it could be could be applied to to a lot of things there are roundabout ways that you can use this uh for measuring peptides of course so if you wanted to potentially stick an antigen in there and detect it sure you could absolutely do that way more expensive than your other methodologies way more expensive so if you have the ability especially if you're talking something that you can't easily pull out a solution either because you have a low antigen load for instance um this could purify it you could probably you could probably go ahead and get a peak to pull out a very very small amount of antigen from a very large antigen pool. So if you have something that's present, say at a low, low level, but compared to say a carious test, where you may get the exact same thing if you're, if you're, if your say organism in question is bacteria, a carious test might be much cheaper than this. And you would and you wouldn't have to go through the validation process for some of your more exotic organisms. This would be very handy for something that's very well known. People know what the MSMS profile of 
E. coli peptides look like. They know what the MSMS profile of yeast, particular yeast peptides look like. They may not know what the MSMS profile for paracoxy or, you know, insert whatever, you know, super, super rare carini bacterium or something like that because nobody's going to study it because there's no clinical really? use for it. So that's where it becomes a problem. You have to know the mass to charge ratios that you expect. You can make educated guesses based on the structure of the thing you're pulling out, but mm -hmm. you'd have to be able to verify everything coming out. So there. So it's like, you know, like, I mean, we check Tylenol levels, mm -hmm. um, aspirin levels. Yeah, you can ask. Yep. So I'm just thinking, like, how do they, what do they use to do that? And versus something like this, they may, they may use some sort of, my, my guess is a lot of, a lot of the, those can be used like, uh, like using color assays and stuff like that. Um, that's, those are a lot of the, uh, like cheap ways that people can do like, um, and I couldn't tell you the specific reaction, but my guess would be something like that, which could basically give you a general quantification based on a color, uh, colorimic assay. Okay. Um, they could ostensibly do the same thing here. Um, but if you can have a cheaper, easier test, why do it? Uh, the thing with the boriconazole is that this is the best way to do it, which is why it's so expensive. Um, if somebody figures out how to make boriconazole testing cheaper, easier, lighter, and specific to boriconazole, you're going to make a ton of money and you can retire. Um, <laughs> but it's, until that until that happens, you're going to need one of these magungas in your uh, in your arsenal, unfortunately, and you and you're going to have to know how to use it very well in order to to tailor it appropriately. Which you're going to have to have people way smarter than us uh, figuring out how this sucker works. Um, but Canela has a, a comment or a question. Canela. So, so Jessica, the word you were looking for is validation. Thank um, you. Okay, number one. Number two, go back to the to the um, LC. So w there's also high put through, right? And also high, you know, high pressure and ultra pressure, high pressure um, liquid chromatography. Those are even more expensive. But oh, yeah. they are they are superb in terms of how they do what they do and do it well. Yep. So yep. the the lab at the University of Florida, um, Chuck Pelican's lab has like I don't know like six of these, and he's got and he does it for beta lactams, all kinds of other antibiotics and antivirals, and you're able to get a a real level. I got a bedaquil level on a patient from Moffitt the other day from his lab. So it yep. is it, and, and it's really awesome. In fact. We're doing this with Stephanie Zhao um, at the USF College of Pharmacy, um, you know, for our seed grant here to look at septipedia and peptazo in septic patients. And so it's and and it's not as expensive. The cartridges and stuff are not as expensive as you would think. It's the actual maintenance of the of the of the machine that She's is expensive. the real cost of this, not just the purchasing of it, but the maintenance. So that's why mm -hmm. it's such a hot and mess to keep one of these things but once you have it it's awesome so oh, yeah. if um and, and we're going to probably have this at some point in the va in the near future to look at beta lactam levels because that's what that's, that's what we're pushing so yeah you can see why this would be be very 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 powerful yeah we had we had an hplc in our lab and i think we had to have a maintenance contract with it for the first year or so and it's upwards of thousands and thousands of dollars just to main just have the maintenance contract not the maintenance um and the columns get old quickly especially if you're using them often and so columns can range anywhere from three four hundred dollars a column to thousands of dollars a column for say an SEC column or something like that so if you're processing a lot of samples you're going to go through columns like it's going out of style um so it's it's there's just general cost and these things are so <clears throat> don't ask me how i know but they're so, they're, they're quite easy to break um, so <laughs> Um, so yeah, a little, little percussive maintenance here and there has, has to be undertaken, uh, by people who actually know what they're doing. Um, okay. one more question from the virtual audience, Yuri, are there any other tests that we use for shoe craft quantization casting or question mark? His curiosity has peaked. Great presentation. <laughs> oh, thanks, Yuri. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm sure there are, but I don't know. Um, That'd be that that would be a great thing to read about, as a matter of fact. So get back to me. Right? <laughs> if, if you want to talk about the glory the glory of the horseshoe crab, by all means. <laughs> um I have already exceeded my time, so we will we will leave it at that.
sure you learned, you learned.